going to be talking about how paleontology has inspired uh, science fiction and fantasy uh, in various media. And uh, it's, well, I can't do like a, a total survey because there are a lot of, you know, subtle sorts of hints in all sorts of different uh, um, media. Uh, so there's no way that I could ever hope to cover it all, but we'll catch some of the more famous ones. Uh, we'll get some of the obscure ones and uh, everything in between that I can fit into about a half hour. So um, if you guys have any questions um, during the presentation, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, if they're a little off topic, I might say, well, I'll answer that at the end of the um, program, uh, but I'm happy to answer any of them. It is the summer lecture series, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be sitting up here like a professor lecturing you, and, you know, it's a lot more informal than that. Godzilla. Um, that's at least the first one that I think of when it comes to paleontology inspiring uh, some kind of science fiction. Um, and, and this is uh, the original Godzilla. Now, in that movie, uh, they kind of hinted that uh, Godzilla was a Tyrannosaurus Rex or something like it uh, that ended up in the ocean and was somehow revived uh, by nuclear energy. Uh, but this clearly isn't a Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's got arms that are way too long. Uh, they probably chose Tyrannosaurus Rex not just because it's scary, but because uh, the way Tyrannosaurus was portrayed at the time, uh, with that posture that kind of looks like a kangaroo's, it would be really easy to get a guy in a rubber costume to make that happen. Uh, they specifically went with um, human actors in costumes instead of how they were doing things in America with stop motion animation uh, because they felt that uh, it, it had a more natural uh, sort of look to it in terms of movement. So uh, they didn't just want uh, kind of a weird looking Tyrannosaurus Rex. And so they ended up adding a couple of features from other dinosaurs, uh, most notably those plates on the back from Stegosaurus. They did do some kind of dragonish embellishment to that, but basically Godzilla the Tyrannosaurus with Stegosaurus plates. Godzilla's uh, design hasn't really changed all that much over the years. There have been you know, different variations on it that look really different uh, in the 60s. But you still have kind of that general Tyrannosaur profile. You've got that general uh, Stegosaurus plate uh, sort of thing going on. Uh, the Japanese call these giant monsters uh, in, in this film genre kaiju. And there are several other kaiju in the Godzilla verse in particular that uh, are based on uh, different kinds of prehistoric animals. Rodan, for example, is based on uh, Pteranodon, uh, but it's got like two crests, more like horns, um, than the one that you see on Pteranodon there. There's also one called Anguirus that looks a little bit like a cross between an ankylosaurus and a rat, of all things. So, at least to me, but it's kind of a funny little, uh, um, little for a kaiju, uh, sort of a guy that will roll into a ball like an armadillo and spin around, and it's got all sorts of funky spikes. Um, now that's, you know, usually looked at as a Japanese sort of a thing, but of course uh, America has its own varieties, and there are actually several different countries that have done kaiju-type movies. Uh, probably the most famous would be King Kong. And uh, the funny thing about King Kong is that the, the filmmakers probably just wanted a large gorilla because of the theme of the movie. Uh, at that time in particular, uh, uh, different filmmakers and storytellers were really interested in looking into kind of the, the dark side of man. Joseph Conrad um, wrote Heart of Darkness um, kind of around this time. So, you know, th this is probably more meant to represent um, uh, the savagery of the natural world uh, rather than anything else. But um, we do have a fossil animal that kind of fits the whole idea of a giant ape. It's called Gigantopithecus. And all we have uh, recovered for that particular uh, taxon is just jaws. They're big enough that we can tell that it was uh, probably the largest of the great, great apes, uh, even outweighing us. 
Um, us and gorillas are the largest uh, currently living. Uh, but this guy would have been pretty darn big. Sometimes you'll hear people speculate that uh, the Yeti uh, or the abominable snowman is uh, a remnant gigantic pithecus, or sometimes you know, we'll say Bigfoot is that. Because really when gigantic pithecus was first discovered, they could only tell that it was a, a large ape. A lot of times it was um, portrayed as a large gorilla like it. Um, nowadays, uh, we we recognize that it's uh, more closely related to orangutan. How, how many of you have ever seen uh, Disney's uh, remake, live action remake of the Jungle Book? Oh, a bunch of you. Okay, cool. You might remember King Louie uh, looked a lot bigger than he did in the cartoon, right? Um, if, if you listen to the, the song in the credits, but they specifically label uh, King Louie as a gigantic pithecus in that film. Uh, in Peter Jackson's King Kong, um, instead of like in the original where they just kind of put dinosaurs there for a reason and they're supposed to be like you know, dinosaurs but they don't care to think about how they would get down in the South Pacific or not, uh, in Peter Jackson's King Kong uh, they kind of hint that uh, Skull Island is uh, part of a lost continent, and that's how dinosaurs could get onto it. Um, but they don't try to take a North American tax and like Tyrannosaurus Rex and put it in the South Pacific. Uh, they were much you know, smarter about that. This is, is not Tyrannosaurus Rex, this is a fictional dinosaur called Vastatosaurus, and it's something that you know, lives only on Skull Island and only ever lived on Skull Island. There are several um, major anatomical differences, but it does fit the general profile of a Tyrannosaurus Rex and was inspired by it. Let's go obscure here for a little bit. Uh, this is Beyond Oasis, uh, which is a game that was on the Sega Genesis uh, back in the 90s. So uh, I loved playing this game when I was a teenager, and there I just dated myself. <laughs> uh, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, I want you to take a look at this dragon and its design. Um, you'll notice a couple of things that are uh, kind of cribbed, uh, specifically off of dinosaurs. Uh, there are some interesting claws here that uh, work along with dinosaurs, but the head is kind of a major thing. Um, forget the ears, forget the fuzz, forget the horns. Just look at the shape of that head for a second. This is Tyrannosaurus Rex. Look familiar? There's something about a Tyrannosaurus Rex's head that has a really unique sort of a shape. And a lot of times, uh, we don't necessarily pay attention to all the variations in uh, the big meat eating dinosaurs. Uh, they, they all just kind of get lumped into Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, in pop culture. But Tyrannosaurus Rex itself is a really unique looking sort of an animal, and we keep looking at it a lot. And so this kind of gets imprinted uh, in the back of our minds, and that's one reason why um, you'll get science fiction and fantasy authors um, kind of drawing from paleontology. Uh, we recognize this kind of head as threatening because what else is T-Rex's reputation, right? And so putting that on a dragon is kind of subliminal sort of a way of saying, hey, this is scary, you should be scared. And it works. Back to Beyond Oasis, which, you know, it's got, there's a fairy, so, you know, very much a, a fantasy sort of a thing. And yet, here's another fossil animal. Uh, definitely didn't act, uh, this boss character doesn't act like the original animal and doesn't really uh, look like it when you got beyond the head. It also has stuff that the original animal would have even had, like kind of this mouth on a tentacle, like on um, like a xenomorph on alien. And it's spitting out rocks and stuff like that. In fact, it kind of looks like it's made out of rock. Interesting uh, reinterpretation of this fossil. This is a fossil fish from the Devonian called uh, Dungalosteus. And uh, you're, you're going to see a few of these other fish because they're really, really weird. Sometimes they didn't have jaws. Uh, sometimes, well, I mean, the, the uh, defining characteristic of uh, a lot of them is that they were, their heads and uh, kind of front half of their body were covered in this bony armor plate. Um, interesting thing with Dungalosteus, it doesn't actually have teeth. 
uh, these are kind of edges of its skull plating that are pointed to act like teeth. Um, had one of the most powerful jaws uh, in Earth's history as well. I don't know that it's ever been ranked like top 10 most powerful jaws in Earth's history, but um, this one probably ranks up among the top five and wouldn't be very far beyond behind Tyrannosaurus Rex. You guys uh, fans of Pokemon? Got any Pokemon fans here? I do. Yeah? Awesome! So, of course, you'd be uh, familiar with the fossil Pokemon then, uh, I would imagine. I'm just going to show you a few of them because there's a whole bunch. But, uh, you know, Pokemon is short for Pocket Monster. And so these are monsters. They are not, you know, real animals. That's why they can fit inside a Pokeball. Uh, but uh, these particular ones are based on uh, an animal that they have a sculpture of just out here. Uh, called a Margosaurus. I'm going to bring around a model of a Margosaurus so you can see it a little bit easier. Really weird sauropod. Uh, it's got kind of a shortish neck for a sauropod. And that neck has all sorts of uh, bony decoration on it. We're not sure whether they would have been spines or whether they would have been fins. Uh, the most recent paper on that suggests that they were indeed fins, like on our sculpture outside. This one's kind of um, hedging its bets by having half fin, half uh, spine. It's got this kind of uh, decoration, kind of a horsey looking head, and I suspect that's one reason why um, most of the time, unless like you've got something that's meant to be strictly nature based, like this particular model, uh, you will find a Margosaurus, um, usually in colors that are typically marketed as feminine. Um, this is Amara and Aurorus, and you know they've got kind of that pastel sort of a um, coloration, possibly to appeal to uh, little girls because that might look to someone like uh, a horse's mane. And for some reason, toy makers think that uh, horses and girls go together. I don't know why. <laughs> kind of weird, but I blame my little pony. <laughs> I've got a whole bunch of them though. Uh, this is Omastark, the scarier looking one, and then the cuter looking one is Omanite, and they are all based on ammonites. So these are um, uh, ocean dwelling critters that lived uh, during the time of the dinosaurs. They're extinct now, but in life they would have looked a little bit like a chambered nautilus, except they have a much rounder uh, sort of a shell. Um, it's also designed a little bit differently. Uh, there are sutures. You won't be able to see it on uh, this one because of the way that it was preserved. But uh, um, if you get the right kind of nanite, you'll see kind of these beef like patterns all over them. Uh, that's something that would allow them to dive extremely deep. One of the cool things is that uh, the Omastar here, can you see these spikes on it? Those aren't embellishments. Some species of ammonite would get spikes uh, a little bit like that. Um, so there's all sorts of interesting ornamentation uh, that might have made them look uh, more intimidating. More likely, it made them look less appetite, uh, appetizing. Uh, large sea reptiles like the mosasaurs uh, would love to eat ammonites, and we do sometimes find ammonites with uh, bite marks from those guys in them. This is Lily, and Lily is based on a crying, which even though it looks a little bit like a plant. This is actually an animal. It's related to starfish. Looks like maybe like related to octopus. It kind of does. Um, uh, it, it, it's more of a, a filter feeder, and so in some ways, like in terms of lifestyle, it's a little bit more like coral. Uh, but it is capable of moving slowly, and we know that because uh, even though uh, crinoid fossils, we'll, we'll find them as far back as like about 400 million years. Uh, give or take, uh, they're still alive today. And so we can uh, observe their behavior uh, directly. This is a North. And it might look a little bit like a lobster, uh, but it's actually based on uh, kind of this weird, really old group of animals called Anomalocaris. Uh, the name Anomalocaris means strange shredding. And that's because for years and years, the only parts that we found were these mouth parts, and they look like strange shrimp. Um, it wasn't until recently that we found 
uh, a full amount of carrot, and since then we found like a whole family of a bunch of them. This is one of them, it's called uh, Lagania, or rather this is a, a life-size model. So they're not terribly big, but they look like space aliens. Uh, they don't really have any uh, relatives today, I mean they are uh, loosely, loosely related to uh, the arthropods, um, at least last I checked. They're so new that uh, sometimes they're kind of shift around in their classification. Um, these guys would kind of swim around and then use these mouth parts, kind of like uh, tentacles, to grab onto things and then shove it into this sucker-shaped uh, mouth. Since we're talking about uh, Japanese stuff, we might as well talk Studio Ghibli, right? Um, how many of you have ever seen this movie, Pong? Just one of you? Okay. Kind of a charming little movie. Uh, it's based on Hans Christian Andersen's uh, The Little Mermaid, but it is a very different and very Japanese sort of take on it. Uh, during the, the course of, of these things, Ponyo, who's you know kind of the Little Mermaid sort of a character, she causes some mischief and upsets some magic, and that upsets the, the balance of the sea, and uh, the ocean ends up going kind of crazy, and in part takes over the land. It's really unfortunate the timing of uh, when this came out. It came out uh, not long before the tsunami uh, hit Japan uh, from that uh, nine point something earthquake, just you know, devastating. And so that kind of hit a little bit close to home for a lot of Japanese. Uh, but um, you got to hear there, it's kind of a, a nice little story, uh, just the same. And during that imbalance of, uh, of the ocean due to magic, not only do you have fish kind of coming up and uh, living on land, and somehow that's okay, and like humans can deal with that um, because it's magical, but uh, it also ends up reviving uh, certain kinds of fossil fish. So this is uh, a cartoon of a real uh, fossil animal. Uh, this is Bacchariolipus, and this is uh, kind of like Douglas. Yes, this is another one of those um, armored Devonian fish. Only the, this guy was more of like a bottom feeder, um, kind of a, a sucker. And he probably would use these uh, kind of spiny looking uh, pectoral fins uh, to kind of walk along uh, the bottom of, of the ocean, just sucking things up. And then it could kind of get home faster if it needed to. Uh, for some reason, there are a lot of fish um, from that time period that have kind of this almost turtle like head um, that was just covered. Uh, with this bony armor plate. We're not entirely sure why, um, although I have heard hypotheses saying that they uh, ended up, like fish generally ended up getting rid of this armor simply because uh, going fast worked a lot better. In this we also have uh, the coelacanth. Now coelacanth uh, actually refers to a whole group of fishes. You've got uh, the rayfin fishes, and those are uh, a lot of the fish that uh, live today. The coelacanths only have one surviving member that we know of, and that's Latimeria, uh, which is the coelacanth uh, that you've probably heard of. Uh, this is a coelacanth, and I couldn't find what kind of a species it is, but you can tell from these fins that it's a coelacanth. They're known as the lobe fin fishes, and they have kind of limb-like uh, fins that they can use to kind of walk around on uh, the ocean floor if they, if they need to. This is another Studio Ghibli film, uh, the first one that uh, Hayao Miyazaki did, um, uh, called Kazunatani no Nashka, or uh, Nausicaa of the Valley of Wind. Uh, it's set in a post-apocalyptic uh, time, um, after lots and lots of wars, and it features like these giant war machines, um, one of which they're, they're trying to revive. Um, but it's also a post kind of pollution uh, sort of a case. And this creature back here, you can't really see it, but it looks like an enormous uh, pill bug. Um, it, and when I say enormous, like um, this is kind of a trick of perspective. Um, Nausicaa would be able to fit inside one of those eyes. Terms of scale. So, really, really big. And the insect uh, in, in this uh, sci, sci fi sort of setting uh, are helping to clean up uh, the planet from all this uh, pollution. Uh, there's this forest that has these huge insects in it, 
um, that's you know full of these uh, toxins. And uh, so it's got some really big, really unusual bugs. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, this is a uh, heavy pure, if I remember correctly. Uh, the heavy part of that uh, means snake in Japanese. Um, and so this is an insect that's kind of long and snaky, but usually with insects, you only get two pairs uh, of wings. Um, in beetles, for example, they kind of modified that uh, forewing into a shell that covers up the hind wing uh, to protect it. Okay? So that's, that's a pattern that all modern insects uh, really follow, but there's a prehistoric insect that breaks it and ends up with um, an extra set of wings, kind of like this heavy kure does. So I'm not sure that uh, uh, an animal like this helped to inspire that. Uh, they may have just, you know, stuck extra wings on to make it look cool. Okay? But it is interesting that, you know, if they did it that way, that we ended up finding fossil animals that were just like this. Here you can see the forewing and the hindwing, and that's what they would use to fly. So then you've got these other things here that might have been used for uh, display or might have had uh, an aerodynamic function. We're not entirely sure which, but those are true wings. Go figure, three sets of wings. This is a family of insects, uh, if I remember correctly, they're called uh, the Paleodictotera. Let's get back to some more familiar stuff. Have you guys ever seen Dragon Heart? Yeah. So this came out in 1996, uh, only a few years after Jurassic Park, and uh, as a result, it was pretty heavily influenced by it. Partly because of the technology, um, if I remember correctly, it won an Academy Award for its visual effects. Uh, where you know Draco, uh, the dragon character, uh, was mostly computer animated. Uh, he was voiced by Sean Connery, and uh, some of the uh, design aspects of this uh, were done to reflect that. But they were also heavily influenced by dinosaurs. Next slide. Usually in uh, European art, in particular, but uh, you know most older pictures of dragons, they've got kind of that sprawling sort of a lizard uh, posture, but because they wanted to pair this dragon character with uh, live action, you know, actual human actors, uh, Hollywood magic trickery uh, sorts of stuff with it. And this posture is actually one of them because this is a post Jurassic Park and Jurassic Park ended up being such a success, successful movie. People started thinking of uh, dragons as a little bit more uh, dinosaur-like. Uh, so this was a way to kind of tap into it and make it look more like a dinosaur and tap into that sense of uh, what artists call verisimilitude uh, or true to life um, in order to create the uh, illusion. So it's not just the technology, it's also the character design. Uh, this is the side of Draco's face. You, they made it kind of foreshortened a little bit uh, in part to make it uh, easier for them to take Sean Connery's um, uh, facial expressions and put them on a drag. Okay. But Take a good look at that profile. You'll find that it's also pretty familiar to this dinosaur. That dinosaur, which happens to be right outside the doors here. Uh, this is Carnotaurus, which was uh, discovered in 1985. And so it was kind of in the pop culture consciousness uh, by the time this film came out. You can see uh, Drago's head is pretty much a Carnotaurus head, uh, just with a lot of more horns on the top. And you'll see this with like a lot of dragons, especially you know since uh, Jurassic Park. It's um, like how to train your dragon. Those are more cartoony sorts of dragons, and yet uh, you can see some uh, clear influence from characters like Draco, which were from dinosaurs. Uh, for Toothless, uh, the main dragon there, they also drew from a black cat. Let's go back to video games for a little bit. Uh, this is from a video game called Soul Calibur, uh, which has been uh, around for decades. Um, it's a fighting game uh, with medieval weaponry, and so it's kind of cool. But because of that, it's got this uh, um, uh, fantasy character, uh, kind of based on stuff I think from uh, Conan. Uh, this is Lizard Man. And he should look a, a lot like a lizard, you would think, because of the name, right? Um, and a lot of the earlier models of Lizard Man looked like, you know, a lizard on two legs or, you know, 
kind of a lizard-human hybrid. But as uh, um, as time has gone on, with each new installment of uh, of the franchise, since Lizard Man, he's a lizard, so he doesn't have to wear clothes, right? So he doesn't have a lot of costuming that you can change, like he, uh, like they did with the human characters. And so instead, they started embellishing um, what his actual body looked like. And it's been getting steadily more and more dinosaur-like. Some models have even been based uh, very directly on dinosaurs. You can see how it's got kind of this uh, dome sort of a head on this guy. Uh, well, that's uh, very similar to the bone-headed dinosaurs, the pachycephalosaurs. Here's one of the pachycephalosaurs that we have at uh, the park here. Uh, but you can see he's got the same sort of a uh, bone dome there. Uh, we also have Stygian Moloch, and that's got that bony dome as well. This isn't the best picture, but uh, if you look, take a look at his head, you've got that prominent nose horn, and then kind of this frill coming off the back of his head with these spikes coming off the back of the frill. Next slide. Just like this dinosaur, this is Styracosaurus. So here's Blizzard Man from the third game, and this is where they started kind of putting feathers on. Now, do lizards have feathers? No. no. But some dinosaurs do have feathers. Uh, they wouldn't be sparse uh, like on here, but there's a lot of dinosaur art, especially from the 90s, that does show sparse feathering with a whole lot of scaling. That doesn't really work with how we know um, feathers work out. Um, the fact that um, birds have scaly uh, lower legs, that, that's kind of unusual um, based on the overall evolution of how feathers work out. Uh, but that is kind of a signal that they're drawing on dinosaurs uh, for inspiration here. And of course, you know, this guy already, you can kind of see it's got a bit of a frill here. Uh, his head's starting to look uh, a lot more like a ceratopsian's uh, horned dinosaur. You can see he's got an even more ceratopsian looking head here. Uh, with the feathers, they, they give him full on feathered wings. And for some reason, like, those wings completely disappear unless you're doing certain moves. So this is clearly a very uh, magical sort of a character. And I guess that's why he's the lizard man. He was a guy and then he was a lizard and then he was a lizard man, but his name was still Trotter or something like that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, one kind of funny thing about this is that uh, uh, he pretty consistently has theropod feet. Theropods have those three toes plus like a dew claw um, up top. And no, like lizards have the five uh, fingers. You can check that out on uh, our iguana, uh, Mr. Mister. So uh, they always give him dinosaur feet, but like dinosaur feet, he's got kind of a weird um, spiky tail like Stegosaurus. And so they just keep drawing uh, on dinosaurs for that. So this is really, really obscure. Uh, this is a, a Dreamcast game uh, called Armada. Uh, this is essentially asteroids, but instead of blowing up asteroids, they're being attacked by these strange aliens that are kind of like, I mean, they're, they're, they're single organisms. Uh, they have kind of a hive mind, and they act like giant starships. You can fly from planet to planet, uh, you know, just shooting these aliens all asteroid style, and then you can kind of go down on the planet and some of these planet-based aliens and some of the ones in space in certain regions look almost exactly like this fossil. This is a trilobite. They have several varieties. All of them, I think, are based on a real trilobite fossils. They're not based on the trilobite organism, uh, just fossils. Trilobites are great because like, you can use um, them for all sorts of imaginary sorts of stuff. Uh, the Ute Indians around here, for example. You see how um, trilobite bodies are kind of ribbed? Kind of looks like uh, the armor of uh, Plains Indians, right? The Utes called these armored water bugs. And uh, they believed that through uh, sympathetic magic, so this is the same kind of magic that uh, a voodoo doll is supposed to operate on, right? Um, they believed that with sympathetic magic, that if you made like a necklace of trilobites, then they, their armor would impart an armor to you and act as protection. Star Wars! That's kind of famous, isn't it? 
C-3PO? Yes. Yeah, this is from the first movie. He's walking across a sand dune. The sky is like way up there. Okay. Um, so this is after he's arrived on Tatooine, but he's kind of uh, gone his separate ways from uh, R2-D2. Okay. And at one point, he comes uh, across the skeleton of uh, what in the universe is called a, uh, uh, a greater crate jacket, or something like that. But if you take a closer look at the bones, especially these ones here, and look at their shapes, guess what we have? What the filmmakers did is they just took uh, an Apatosaurus spine and then put a sculpted skull on the end of it that's like way too big uh, to actually fit. Um, probably about like seven or eight times as big as the skull would be. But yeah, that's a sauropod uh, spinal cone. But you'll see this kind of shape to some of those bones closer to the head and that kind of shape on the bones kind of farther from the head. They really did just take casts of dinosaur bones, stick them up there, and uh, there you go. But that's not the neat part of this. The neat part of this is that there are deserts on this planet that you can go to and see that same sort of a thing. This is, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's in Egypt. It's Wadi Al something. Um, and this is a valley where uh, that used to be underwater um, uh, when whales uh, were first showing up. This is a whale skeleton. But it's a whale called Basilosaurus, which kind of was long and looked like a sea serpent, especially uh, when it's skeletal. So I don't know if this skeleton eroded out uh, naturally like that or not. I've never been there myself. Um, usually when you get wet around like this, uh, the bones will be a little bit more scattered, but uh, I mean, you can see there are tortoises in the background there. You can go and uh, visit this place if you're ever in Egypt. And uh, it's like this valley of sea serpents, just like what you kind of see in Star Wars during that scene. So an odd bit of realism in something like Star Wars. Now, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the uh, Indominus Rex of Jurassic World. Uh, I, the, the funny thing about uh, Indominus Rex is that Indominus Rex was, uh, during pre-production, was originally supposed to be Giganotosaurus, which is a real dinosaur. The really kind of giggly part for me is that this character design of this fictional dinosaur that's kind of loosely based on uh, Giganotosaurus ended up being closer to a real Giganotosaurus than the Giganotosaurus of Jurassic World Dominion. This is an example of the filmmakers kind of painting themselves into a corner. Uh, they really wanted to put Giganotosaurus in there. I don't know why they didn't uh, end up putting it in there, but uh, they made this look a lot like a Giganotosaurus. And so for Jurassic World Dominion, they had to make their Giganotosaurus look different from this and therefore different from what a real Giganotosaurus would look like. That's one reason why it's got kind of these weird angles to the um, scales on its back and it looks a lot more uh, dragonish. Um, another kind of funny thing about this, you can see kind of these quills coming off of it. Now this is uh, because this is a, a mutant, kind of made up, uh, sort of a, a dinosaur. Uh, when it comes to big meat-eating dinosaurs, we have found one species that had a thick coat of something like hair. Uh, about the best that we can call it is using the technical terms filamentous integument. Um, it, it's probably something related to feathers. We can't tell whether it's feathers or not. Uh, a lot of people will call it feathers, but it probably isn't feathers as we know them. It's just kind of this fuzz. Uh, it does get about as long, but it was you know thick across the entire body, not sparse like what we see here. Um, like I said, with what we know about how feathers grow, you can't really put them in patches like that uh, around, but that's a trope in dinosaur art. Um, as far as the other big meat-eating dinosaurs that we found, we've only ever found uh, scaly skin patches on them, uh, including Giganotosaurus's um, predecessor, Allosaurus, Indoraptor, and this one's even more fictional. Uh, the, the biggest uh, fictionality about uh, this particular one, you can see how it's walking around on four legs. 
no meat-eating dinosaur that we know of could do that, and certainly not do it the way that it's uh, presented. Um, meat-eating dinosaurs had to keep their palms facing towards each other. Uh, the technical term is medially oriented. Now, they could face them behind, but they'd have to stick their elbows out. Now, unlike mammals, they could not rotate their wrists like this. So they couldn't put their hands on the ground in the way that a mammal does, or in the way that this Indoraptor is doing. They would do it, they'd have to do some kind of an odd knuckle walk, and even then, um, we don't have good evidence for any uh, medium dinosaur doing that. Uh, it's been proposed for Spinosaurus, but uh, that, that's being very complicated, and uh, Spinosaurus is not well supported. Either. So, that's just a, the tip of the iceberg, a sampling of all sorts of stuff that you can see in different media. If you guys are into sci-fi and fantasy, um, pay attention to things like uh, um, uh, character design and so on, and chances are you might be able to find uh, the, the um, artist or filmmaker or whoever will, was taking inspiration uh, from the fossil record uh, to do that. So.